بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فقراءتنا موصولة في كتاب تهذيب الأسماء واللغات للحافظ النووي رحمه الله تعالى في باب وصف خلق النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. We are continuing our reading of a chapter in the book تهذيب الأسماء واللغات for الحافظ النووي رحمه الله. Uh, this class is on Zad al-Ma'ad. However, uh, this portion of the book, which we initially did not do when we began the series, this portion is very important and it is more complete and more comprehensive from Tahdib al-Asma' wal lughat This is where the origin of uh, many of these things come from. Uh, going all the way back to Shama'il, uh, Shama'il al-Tirmidhi, rahimahullah, Imam al-Tirmidhi, in the third century, uh, authored a book other than his Sunan, known as uh, Shama'il, which, in which he gathers all of the narrations discussing the Prophet Wasallam's descriptions and anything having to do with him. So, the reason why we are reading this from Tahdib al-Asma wal lughat is because it's more comprehensive. And then, inshallah, we will continue on in Zad al-Ma'ad. All of our classes in Zad al-Ma'ad have not been exclusively taken from Zad al-Ma'ad. There are things which we have discussed and added from other books as well. Uh, as we mentioned before, Zad al-Ma'ad is very comprehensive, but nonetheless, Al-Hafidh ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he wrote the book from memory. And so uh, there are some uh, additional things which he didn't mention, either because he didn't think of them uh, at the time of writing the book or because he was, uh, he left them out for whatever purpose. يقول النووي رحمه الله تعالى وكان يبيت هو وأهله ليالي طاويين And <coughs> the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم spent many of his nights along with his wives in uh, a state of hunger. This was due to poverty, due to the fact that they were in Medina, they had just migrated, they are just getting their own footing uh, started. Also, the issue of uh, Ghazu, they were under siege a lot of times, they were uh, out in battle and so forth, and these things demand a lot of resources. So uh, the beginning days in Medina were very, very difficult. And the Prophet وسلم, his mattress that he would lay on was usually made from a hide. Usually uh, it would either be sheep hide or goat hide. And the stuffing of the mattress is a leaf. And leaf is when you chip the bark off of a palm tree, there's this kind of, uh, it's almost like shredded newspaper inside, right? This spongy, this here is called leaf. So what is between the bark and the actual uh, wood of the palm tree, that leaf, they would scrape that out because it has some fluff to it and they would stuff their mattresses with that. Usually, those mattresses were not considered very comfortable, obviously. These are, these are the traits of a person 
who, whom his mattress is very, very uh, thrifty, very, very, uh, very, uh, this is not something that is a trade of the people of wealth. People of wealth, they would either use um, hair or they would use you know, cotton or any of the things that we stuff our mattresses with today. But his was made of leather and it was stuffed with uh, leaf. وَكَانَ مُتَقَلِّلًا مِنْ أَمْتِعَةِ الدُّنْيَا كُلِّهَا قد أعطاه الله تعالى مفاتيح خزائن الأرض كلها فأبى أن يأخذها واختار الآخرة عليها He says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had very few possessions. Basically any possession of his that he had had a purpose and he only had exactly the amount of things that he needed in order to get through his day and night. So his possessions were very few. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him the keys to opening the treasures of the entirety of the earth. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chose uh, to not be privy to those riches and that he chose sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the hereafter over this dunya. And now he says, وَكَانَ كَثِيرَ الذِّكْرِ دَائِمَ الْفِكْرِ جُلُّ ضَحِكِهِ التَّبَسُّمْ وَضَحِكَ فِي أَوْقَاتٍ حَتَّى بَدَتْ نَوَاجِذُهُ وَهِيَ الْأَنْيَابِ He mentions here that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in constant remembrance of Allah and was in constant deep thought very meditative, alayhi salatu wassalam. And most of the time, when, uh, you know, if there was something funny or something, he would smile. Rarely he would uh, smile wide enough at some times that his teeth would show, his rear teeth would show. However, uh, most of the time it was just a smile. وَيُحِبُّ الطِّيبُ وَيَكْرَهُ الْرِيحِ الْكَرِيهَ And he was very fond of perfumes. And he very much disliked uh, smells that were foul and offensive. وَيَمْزَحُ وَلَا يَقُولُ إِلَّا حَقًّا And he used to play and joke on occasion, but never... Uh, with that which is inaccurate or untrue. Never uh, w by saying something that is untrue, he would only say that which is true and that which is appropriate, even in his jokes. And a person who comes to him with an excuse, he would accept the excuse. This is an, an impressive trait, that a person accept the excuse of a person who is um, apologizing or trying to excuse themselves. A lot of times people's excuses are not very valid. A lot of times people's excuses are very pathetic. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, خذ العفو وَأْمُرْ بِالْعُرْفُ وَأَعْرِضْ عَنِ الْجَاهِلِينَ هَذَا مِنَ الْعَفُوْ خُذْ الْعَفُوْ فَعُذْرُ النَّاسِ حَتَّى لَوْ كَانَتْ هَذِيَ الْأَعْذَارِ غير صحيحة غير دقيقة حتى أعذار المنافقين كان يقبلها النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وقال الله تعالى له وقل اعملوا فسيرى الله عملكم ورسوله هو المؤمنون a lot of times when people give excuses for their foul actions or their behavior or their inaction or their complacency, their excuses are not valid. However, the Prophet ﷺ would not bicker with people 
and he would not hold them uh, and tried to challenge their excuses in most cases. Rather, he would accept their excuse in hopes that they would uh, revisit their action and better themselves. وَكَانَ كَمَا وَصَفَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُّمْ حَرِيصٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ قوله تعالى لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ بالتنوين يعني نكرة ما قال جاءكم الرسول قال جاءكم رسول وهذه من صيغ التعظيم يعني رسول شأنه عظيم رسول من أنفسكم يعني نسبه يلتقي مع أنسابكم ويجري فيها عزيز عليه ما عنتم يعني كل شيء يحصل لكم فيه عنت فهذا شيء يعز عليه صلى الله عليه وسلم العنت يعني التعب والمشقة فأي شيء يتعنت منه أحد من أمته فهذه تعز عليه صلى الله عليه وسلم حريص عليكم الحرص هو الطلب الزيادة والخير بالمؤمنين رؤوف رحيم وهنا جاء التخصيص بالمؤمنين رؤوف رحيم ولم يقل رؤوف رحيم بالمؤمنين وهذا يدل على أن الرأفة والرحمة الزائدة للمؤمنين قسط زائد على غيرهم وهذا من قوله تعالى واخفض جناحك للمؤمنين Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the ninth chapter of the Qur'an, verse number 128. He says that which translates to addressing the companions, radiallahu anhum, and the people of Quraysh specifically. Indeed, an exalted messenger has come to you all from, your, from amongst your own selves. Any type of difficulty is, is hard upon him to see you go through. Meaning that he will avoid and do everything in his power to prevent any difficulty or hardship upon his ummah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes him as well as harisun alaykum. He is in constant constantly striving to obtain the best for you all. And for the believers, he is very forgiving and merciful. وَقَالَ تَعَالَى وَصَلِّ عَلَيْهِمْ إِنَّ صَلَاتَكَ سَكَنٌ لَهُمْ الصلاة هنا بمعنى الدعاء وأيضا بالمعنى العام وَصَلِّ عَلَيْهِمْ أيضا بمعنى صلاة الجنازة هذه الآية أنزلت بالصدقة كان من جاء النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بصدقته بزكاته كان يدعو لهم خذ من أموالهم صدقة تطهرهم وتزكيهم بها وصل عليهم يعني ودع لهم إن صلاتك سكن لهم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in verse number 103 of the ninth chapter, Surah At-Tawbah, He says subhanahu wa ta'ala, that which translates to, and pray for them, meaning the believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the beginning of this verse, instructing uh, his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, take what they bring you of their zakah, and of their charity that they give, this will act as an expiation and a purification for them, and uh, pray for them. Indeed, your prayer is a tranquility that will descend upon them. يقول النووي وكانت معاتبته تعريضا يعني من عاتبه 
من عاتبه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا عاتب أحدا على شيء فعل لما فعلت لما لم تفعل فإنه كان في الغالب تعريضا يقول ما بال أقوام يشترطون شروطا ليست في كتاب الله تعالى ونحو ذلك وهذا مثال ما بال أقوام ما بال يعني ما شأن فهذا تعريض كان الإنسان إذا فعل شيئا وأراد النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أن يعاتب هذا الفعل أو صاحب هذا الفعل إذا كان في جماعة قال ما بال أقوام يفعلون كذا وكذا أو لا يفعلون كذا وكذا هذا هو التعريض ليس مباشرة النووي tells us that often times when the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم wish to admonish someone for doing something someone who, who does something or or admonish people for not doing something that they should have been doing usually this was very indirect he would indirectly admonish how would he indirectly admonish he would speak to the group intending a particular person or a particular action so if there's a group instead of pointing out the person and admonishing the person rebuking the person publicly he would admonish in a generalized way indirectly and say something along the lines what is with such and such people who do such and such or people who do not do such and such etc there are many examples of this يَقُولُ وَيَأْمُرُ بِالرِّفْقِ وَيَحُثُّ عَلَيْهِ وَيَنْهَى عَنِ الْعُنْفِ وَيَحُثُّ عَلَى الْعَفُو وَالصَّفْحِ وَمَكَارِمِ الْأَخْلَاقِ وَيُحِبُّ التَّيَمُّنْ فِي طُهُورِهِ وَتَرَجُّلِهِ وَتَنَعُّلِهِ وَفِي شَأْنِهِ كُلِّهِ هذا كلام عائشة رضي الله عنها في البخاري Nawawi here describes the Prophet وسلم, saying that he would uh, be constantly commanding and reminding people to be gentle. Gentleness is the, the norm. Harshness is the exception. Is there a place for harshness? Yes, there's a place for harshness. But harshness is the exception. It is the exception to the rule. The norm is gentleness. And he would encourage people to be gentle amongst one another. And he would discourage people likewise uh, from harshness, to not be harsh. And he would constantly encourage people to forgive, to pardon one another. This issue of uh, gentleness it doesn't just mean gentleness with other people it doesn't just mean gentle with certain people in general anytime we deal with another person gentleness is the uh, rule harshness is the exception to the rule and the uh, uh, you know abnormal uh, kind of uh, situation also gentleness with oneself. Sometimes a person can be so hard on himself and hold himself to expectations that he could never meet and blame himself to the point where he would drive hopelessness into his heart. This is a great crime in Islam that a person become weary or hopeless of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And actually, this is uh, very arrogant. If a person commits any sin, and they wish to repent, and they view that their sin is greater than Allah's mercy or greater than Allah's forgiveness, or too great for Allah to forgive, 
And this person has committed an even greater sin with such a conception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would constantly encourage people with the best of etiquettes. And he preferred starting with the right, the right side. Whether it be in washing or bathing, whether it be in combing his hair or putting on his shoes and in everything. If there was a situation where he should start with one side as opposed to the other, he would choose to start with the right side. وكانت يده اليسرى لخلائه وما كان من أذى وإذا نام أو اضطجع اضطجع على جنبه الأيمن مستقبل القبلة هذه الزيادة التي ذكرها النووي رحمه الله تعالى من اضطجاعه على شقه الأيمن فهذا صحيح ثابت في الصحيحين في عدة أحاديث لكن هذه هذه الزياده مستقبل القبله يعني حال كونه يستقبل القبله على يمينه وفراشه متجه الى القبله وهذه الزياده ضعيفه ولم ياتي شيء فيما صح عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم او الصحابه يدل على هذا في الراجح من اقوال الحفاظ هذه زياده ضعيفه وإنما كان يضطجع على شقه الأيمن وأما استقبال القبلة فهذا لم يثبت وإنما جاء في رواية حسنها بعض العلماء رحمهم الله إن خير المجالس ما استقبل فيها القبلة وهذا بمعنى في الدعاء وفيما يباح في ذلك الذكر وما شابه ذلك فاستحسنه بعض العلماء uh, Nawawi rahimahullah tells us here that usually his left hand he would use when it comes to doing things or starting with things uh, with regards to uh, cleaning rather than beautifying. So for instance he would use his left hand to uh, wash his private parts and so forth as opposed to his right. Likewise when he would go to sleep he would sleep on his right side. And now we here adds that he would sleep on his right side towards the qibla. And this is, this is uh, not authentic. The correct opinion of the scholars of Islam with regards to these narrations that tell us that his mattress was facing towards the Qibla, these are weak narrations. We don't have anything, uh, anything uh, authentic and explicit stating that he would face the Qibla in his sleep. Rather, uh, the most that there is is a narration in which the Prophet وسلم, said the best of positions to sit are those uh, sittings or those positions in which the Qibla is faced. And this is meant for in, in, in dua, etc. If a person wishes to just make dua, they want to sit down to make dua, it is okay for them to sit down and face the Qibla. However, this is not uh, necessarily for sleeping only. كذلك يقع هذا عند كثير من الناس في استقبال القبلة عند الذبح. عند الذبح. ماذا يقولون؟ يقولون تضجع الشاة على شقها الأيمن وتتجه القبلة. وهذا لم يثبت عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال به بعض الفقهاء لكن ليس عليه دليل صريح صحيح وهذا يغلب ليش لأنه أكثر الناس يذبح بيمينه صح ولا لا أنا إذا أضجعت الشاه مثلا الذبيحة على شقها الأيمن صرت الحين بدي أذبح بيش اليسار 
وهذا لم يثبت عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان كان يذبح بيمينه فهذه زيادة يفعلها كثير من العوام ولا حاجة إليها ولم تثبت عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في الراجح من أقوال العلماء uh, Likewise, this issue of the right side We see this often brought up in slaughtering A lot of times people when they slaughter They will take the uh, animal and lay it on its right side if it's an animal that is laid. Not all animals are slaughtered laid down. However, if it is an animal that is laid, like a goat or a sheep, lay it on its right side facing the qibla, and that this is the way that we would slaughter. However, there's no authentic narrations mentioning this way of slaughtering. And this is counterintuitive. Most people are right-handed and we are now demanding from them, if the animal's on its right side, that the person slaughter with his left hand. And this goes against what we know of the Prophet ﷺ's sunnah. ولا تؤبن فيه الحرم أي لا يذكر فيه النساء يتعاطفون فيه بالتقوى ويتواضعون ويوقر ويوقر الكبار ويرحم الصغار أو ويوقر يعني النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يوقر يعني في مجالسه يوقر يعني النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الكبار ويرحم الصغار And now he continues describing to us the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم's uh, presence, his company What kind of company did he provide and what kind of company did he keep? His company was one of forbearance and patience and truthfulness, and honor, and uh, tranquility. This is not a, a rowdy, uh, he would not keep rowdy company. His company would be very tranquil. Voices would not be raised in his presence, nor would uh, foul or vulgar things be mentioned such as descriptions of women and such, and so, and such things, these would not be uh, the topics discussed in the Prophet Wasallam's company. The people that he kept as his company and as his close companions were very close with one another, very affectionate towards one another in piety, and very humble. And... The Prophet وسلم, would give great regard to the elder, those who are older than him, or those who are old in general. And he would be very merciful to those who are young. Uh, ويرحم صغيرنا وكذلك ويوقر الكبار هذا يتمثل في إسلام والد أبي بكر الصديق رضي الله عنه جاء به جاء به أبو بكر ليسلم وكان شيخا كبيرا لحياته كالثغامة يعني مثل الغيم البيضاء فالنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال أفلا أفلا أبلغتني فأتينا الشيخ يعني بدال ما أنت جبت الشيخ علي ليش ما قلت لي أبو بكر أنا بيجي على الشيخ هذا من توخير الكبار ويرحم الصغار يعني يمسح على رؤوسهم ويسلم عليهم وكان أنا صلى الله عنه صغيرا وكان الصحابة هؤلاء صغارا ف 
فكان إذا مر بهم وهم يلعبون كان يسلم عليهم ويلقي إليهم السلام وأحيانا يصافحهم عليه الصلاة والسلام Likewise, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would give great respect to those who are elder. A good example of this is when Abu Bakr's father, radiallahu anhuma, became Muslim. Uh, this was during the conquest of Mecca. Abu Bakr brought his father to the Prophet ﷺ so that he would pledge allegiance and become Muslim. And he was described as being elderly and had a very white and thick beard, very lush white beard that was like a, like a cloud, it was so white. And when he brought him brought his father to the Prophet وسلم, to accept Islam. He said to Abu Bakr, why didn't you tell me? I would have come to him rather than you bring this elder gentleman to me. Likewise, the Prophet وسلم, when he would encounter those who are young, he would show great mercy and he would show them respect. He would speak to children with respect. Of course, children and adults, we speak to them in different ways. However, disrespecting children and thinking that because they have no influence in the world or money in the world, etc., we will only respect people when we um, have a reason to respect them. A child has a right has the right of a Muslim amongst us. A child has the right of a Muslim amongst us. It is impermissible to do anything to children that will harm them or uh, cause them to be sad or upset or feel slighted. This is something that happens often. It's almost like people see children and uh, they don't give them very much respect. They don't give them very much attention, and this is incorrect. It doesn't mean that we treat children exactly as we treat adults. Of course, we speak to them differently. They are on different levels. However, uh, feeling that children have no particular right, this is incorrect. A Muslim child has a right, and children in general, they have rights exactly the same as their adult counterparts from amongst the Muslimin. يقول ويؤثرون المحتاج يعني جلساء أصحابه يؤثرون المحتاج يعني يقدمون الذي لديه حاجة. Likewise, the description of his company was that him and his companions, they would give precedence and give a voice to those who needed something. Anyone who was in need could come and access the Prophet ﷺ and any resources that he or any of his companions had were able to um, allot those resources to this person who was asking, they would do so. They would not hesitate. يقول ويحفظون الغريب And they would also take care of those who are passing through, those who are not from here, those who are not locals, travelers, people who are strangers in their land would find themselves more at home than they would in their own homes. يخرجون أدلة على الخير يعني كانوا يدلون على الخير من جالسهم دل إلى الخير وكما جاء في الحديث صحيح مسلم من دل على خير فله مثل أجر فاعلي Another, another hallmark of 
the Prophet ﷺ's company and his companions, those who would be in his presence, is that they would be constantly a source and a guide to that which is good, that which is wholesome in anything. And the Prophet ﷺ encouraged this when he said, whoever leads to a good, they will receive the reward of the one who does it. Right? Whoever leads to that which is good or encourages that which is good. وَكَانَ يَتَأَلَّفُ أَصْحَابَهُ يَتَأَلَّفُهُمْ يعني يَفْعَلُ مَا يَكُونُ سَبَبًا لِأُلْفَتِهِمْ فقوله وكان يتألف أصحابه أي كان في أفعاله وفي أقواله كان في أفعاله وفي أقواله يتألف يعني يجلب القلوب ويحث على التآلف Nawawi rahimahullah tells us that the Prophet ﷺ's description as well was that he would constantly do things that would um, strike harmony amongst the hearts of his companions. And he would always give esteem and respect to those who were the notables of their people, meaning the tribes, leaders, the chiefs, etc., he would give them their due respect. You cannot speak to a king as you speak to a peasant. There's a certain code of conduct, and he would observe this code of conduct. amrahum, And the Prophet ﷺ would usually not remove the leadership when, when Islam would come into a tribe, a tribe would accept Islam. The leaders before Islam would usually be the same leaders after Islam. They would continue to be leaders. Likewise, he would be constantly uh, examining his companions and looking after them. And he was never vulgar, nor was he ever uh, illicit, and he would never, uh, he would never respond to evil with evil sallallahu alaihi wasallam bal ya'fu wa yasfah rather he would uh, be in constant pardoning and overlooking other people's mistakes and misdeeds wa lam yadrib khadiman and he never struck uh, struck a servant wa lam ra'atan nor a woman wa la shay'an qat nor did he ever strike uh, anything, anything meaning of the things which people usually strike, a servant, uh, women, those children, etc., things, people that, uh, or, or animals. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had never done such a thing, was never recorded that he had done such a thing. Illa an yujahida fi sabilillahi ta'ala. The only time that he would strike with his uh, hand, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in battle. وَمَا خُيِّرَ بَيْنَ أَمْرَيْنِ إِلَّا اخْتَارَ أَيْسَرَهُمَا مَا لَمْ يَكُنْ إِثْمَا هذه مسألة ينساها كثير من الناس يعني كثير من المسلمين يحفظ الشطر الأول وينسى الشطر الثاني يقول لك وَمَا خُيِّرَ بَيْنَ أَمْرَيْنِ إِلَّا اخْتَارَ أَيْسَرَهُمَا ويسكت لا بدك تكملها ما لم يكن إثما بدك تكملها ما لم يكن إثما هذا مثل ما واحد يقرأ فويل للمصلين ويسكت ما يكملها لا كملها صح 
صح ولا لا هذه هذا بتر للروايات هذا منكر وتحكم فكثير من الناس يستشهد بالشطر الاول ويغفل الشطر الاخر another of his descriptions صلى الله عليه وسلم is that any time he had a choice between two things two ways to do something two paths two choices he would always choose that which is easier as long as it wasn't haram if it was haram or something that would lead to haram then he would be the furthest of people away from that haram ودلائل كل ما ذكرته في الصحيح مشهورة وقد جمع الله سبحانه وتعالى له صلى الله عليه وسلم كمال الأخلاق ومحاسن الشيم وآتاه علم الأولين والآخرين وما فيه النجاة والفوز معنى آتاه علم الأولين والآخرين يعني من من الأنبياء ومن الوحي ليس من القدر وليس من لا بعض الناس يغالي يقول هذا النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم اطلع على اللوح المحفوظ يعلم ما يكون في الغد أو ما ك... هذا كله مبالغة وشيء لا يرضاه الله ورسوله وما فيه النجاة والفوز وهو أمي لا يقرأ ولا يكتب ولا معلم له من البشر وآتاه ما لم يؤتي أحدا من العالمين واختاره على جميع الأولين والآخرين صلوات الله وسلامه عليه دائمين إلى يوم الدين ثبت في الصحيح عن أنس بن مالك رضي الله عنه قال ما مسست أو مسست ديباجا ولا حريرا ألين من كف رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ولا شممت أو شممت رائحة قط أطيب من رائحة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ولقد خدمت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عشر سنين فما قال لي قط أف يعني هذا قول تضجر اسم فعل أمر بمعنى أتضجر ولا قال لشيء فعلته لما فعلته ولا لشيء لم أفعله ألا فعلت كذا نسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يرزقني وإياكم علما نافعا ورزقا طيبا وعمل متقبلا This is enough for tonight والله أعلم وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد